Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Hobo, a wandering podcast about cinema. In the last episode with our co-host Ricardo, we talked to Sergei Lotznitsa and Adil Kanyerzanov about their new movies showing at the Tallinn Black Nights Film Festival. So, uh, as always, if you missed it, we suggest you to check it out. Our journey through international cinema takes us now to France, and we are very happy to welcome Julian Foreau, the director of The Witches of the Orient, which premiered here in Italy at the Mostra Internazionale del Nuovo Cinema di Pesaro last year. Hello, Julian, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Ciao. I'll take just a few seconds to introduce the movie to, to our audience. Uh, the Witches of the Orient is the nickname of the Japanese women volleyball team who won Olympic gold at the 1964 games in Tokyo. They started out as the team of a textile factory winning victory after victory and their record of 258 successive win remains unbeaten to this day. Uh, the team were so popular that a whole raft of manga characters, cartoons and uh, anime series was based on them. And Julian Foro had the chance to talk to them and create a sparkling documentary which features interviews, archival footage and scenes from Japanese anime, such as Attack Number, number One. Uh, I would like to start our conversation from, um, with a general question. Do, do you remember when you first heard about the Witches of the Orient? Yeah, um, so I'm in charge of a film, uh, of a film collection um, owned by the, the French Sports Institute, which is a, a public uh, institution in France. And um, about 10 years ago, uh, a French volleyball trainer came to me uh, with two 60 millimeters uh, film. And we watched uh, the two reels and um, it was the very first time I've seen um, the, the witches uh, during the, the training session, and uh, I've never heard of them uh, before. So it was a, a pure uh, discovery. And when I, when I watched the, the film for the first time, I was really impressed and, and stunned by the, the intensity of the, of the training. Uh, it was very far from the standard Back in the 60s, nobody trained that hard, uh, especially for women, because in, in France and Italy, we thought that women were not able to work uh, and train as hard as men. It was very uh, impressive and, and unusual, but it also reminded me uh, all of a sudden um, to not Mimi e la nazionale di Palavalo, but the attacker you because in France, um, Jeanne Serge was more popular um, than Mimi. So it's uh, Mila for, for you Italians. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and I was, you know, really surprised because the, the footage really looks like the, the anime. And as it's, it's the case in, in Italy and in France, uh, everybody knows about um, those anime, but Barely, barely no one know about uh, the fact that it was inspired by a true story. So uh, I came across to the story of the, of the witches through a footage and this footage uh, just revealed how, how much um, it was close to, to the anime we know. And uh, it was really interesting to work on this um, project because of this uh, unknown uh, link with um, um, this premium um, uh, anime uh, and, and very uh, unknown uh, Japanese story. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I would like to ask you something uh, about the idea to gather all the protagonists around the table for lunch. Did you want to ironically recreate the idea of a Sabbath? And uh, in addition to this, I am interested in how the scenes of everyday life that we see in the film were selected. Okay, so I try to make it short because it could be long. Um, I knew that um, this is a collective story. So I was uh, keen on making a film with a collective uh, storytelling um, and because um, I met the players uh, individually. I really need um, 
to create a moment of, of gathering, of sharing. And of course, the Sabbath was, was on my mind. Uh, the round table was, I think, the best um, way to create a kind of intimacy. And we just um, <clears throat> travel around and we have this uh, proper distance between intimacy and outside the sphere, or outside the group. So we can just grab some, some details, but we are not into, you are not in the middle of the center uh, of the round table. So um, we just um, uh, witness this, um, this gathering. It was funny because when I have to, um, to tell to the cinematographer, to Yama, um, the way um, I wanted to shot the scene, I also I have in mind, uh, but maybe not consciously, um, the first scene of uh, Reservoir Dogs, the Quentin Tarantino film, where uh, Mr. Blue, Mr. Pink, etc., are eating and gathering a lunch. And this is also a circle or um, traveling. And I don't know, maybe when I met players, they were very, very tough women and they were very impressive. They were the type of women you don't want to argue with, you know, they were like Mrs. Pink and Mrs. Blue. So it was, it was not really, um, yeah, conscious, but I think um, something um, helped me to, to create this uh, round table with this, um, um, with this in mind, with the Reserve of Dogs uh, uh, main uh, first, first scene. Um, so the, your question was about, um, the, yes, about the, the everyday life uh, scenes yeah. uh, you choose to put in the, into the movie. Well, actually, the process of the film um, was in quite unusual, and let's say in three times. The first time was um, um, I tried to to read a lot and to find um, documents, articles uh, from from the sixties, but also from written by academics. And the more I knew about the story, the more I was um, upset by the fact that many Westerners just nicknamed this uh, coach, the demon coach. And um, they always, the Westerners, to speak generally, sorry, but uh, yeah. feel that this, those women were victims and uh, because they were women and because they were Japanese, they were um, automatically victims. And I really don't uh, like it, um, the, way, the way they were treated and like this, those men speak in the name of this woman. So I choose to, to meet them and give the, the players the opportunity to, uh, to tell their story with their own words and by themselves. So it was, very different, very important and different from my previous uh, work when I didn't um, uh, shot much uh, new materials, but only use uh, found footage. This time there was the need uh, to meet them. Um, so the first uh, step was this um, documentation and then I chose to, to meet them. So it was, in, uh, we made it in two times. The first time uh, we went to Japan in June um, 2019, and I, just, I decided to um, to came and met them only with um, audio recorders, no um, microphones, but no camera. It was much more um, easy to approach them, and I just want also to. Uh, make them understood that uh, I'm not uh, a TV guy and coming to, to her place and, and put a camera in front of her and okay, come on, and tell me what, to, tell me your intimacy, tell me, uh, tell me who you are, was not my, my taste. So um, very politely and, and smoothly, we just meet the first time with only a microphone and then I just translate all the, the discussion and um, our kind of interview and, um, in France. And I choose to, to pick up some excerpt of these long uh, interviews and to build a kind of uh, voiceover. 
collective narration um, when they can when each player could explain in, in rather chronological way their story. And then I asked them individually uh, to choose uh, the place of, of their shooting uh, because my aim was at uh, portraying them. I asked them uh, where would they uh, rather be uh, filmed and, and appeared uh, on, on the screen. So for two of the four players I met, it was uh, very obvious. Uh, Chiba-san, the one uh, who trained at the gym club, she was very proud of it. And she, she showed me her, her muscles and said, come on, you, I, I push uh, heavy loads. Uh, you can shoot me uh, during my, uh, my uh, gym uh, session. And so she, um, Chiba-san chose this place. Uh, Shinozaki chose the, um, uh, the, the training because she was uh, a trainer, a volleyball trainer. So it was uh, quite obvious for, for her to, uh, to, to appear in this scene. And for the two others, we just discussed that uh, it was important for me that they chose um, themselves the place. And Danida San, for instance, was uh, living at that time with her daughters and granddaughters. And she told me that she liked to, to play many games. So when, I, when we met, I, um, I offered her uh, this memory game, uh, which we all know. And um, it was like a private joke, uh, a wink, because I asked her to, uh, to remind of past events and memories and uh, she's playing this memory game with uh, her daughter. So we have a very brief time in Japan because um, it was complicated to, to spend more, more time. Um, so we, we really well prepared the, the shooting before and we spent like all the day for each player for the shooting. So we, we knew exactly what uh, the place uh, of the shooting and uh, they were involved in this choice, which was very info important for me. And for these interviews, you had to um, solve two major problems. The first was the uh, generation gap because you were in your, uh, I think in your early forties and the youngest of the witches was 74 at the time. And uh, of course the second problem was the language. And your solution for both of these issues was to work with Catherine Cadeau, who is uh, known for being the interpreter for uh, Akira Kurosawa, when he came to France and uh, an obituary of, of the Cannes Film Festival in the 80s and, and 90s. Uh, how did you get to know her and how did she help you in, uh, in communicating with, with the protagonists of your film? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Kathleen uh, solved many of um, my problems. Uh, we met before um, on my, one of my previous uh, projects, uh, in 2013, I, I made a film uh, on a film. It was the first feature film of uh, Chris Marker called uh, Olympia 52 on the Helsinki Olympic Games. And because Catherine was um, programming French films at the Yamagata Film Festival, um, she invited the film and she was uh, quite close to Chris Marker. So, um, we, we met very uh, uh, friendly because um, I was also, I feel close in, uh, to, to his marker, to his cinema. And uh, so we were, we met like this. And um, so um, years after this um, uh, meeting for the Chris Marker's film, um, I just um, contact Catherine and tell her that, um, she was the perfect uh, person uh, for me to, to solve the two issues that you mentioned. Of course, the, the fact that the players belongs to a, an, an older generation with other codes, other, other um, way of, um, of behaving. Um, uh, and of course, I don't speak a word of Japanese. So um, Catherine is the exact uh, same age as the players. She's um, 74 and um, she, she lived in, uh, in Japan for years. 
and uh, she, she she even uh, attended uh, the Olympic Games of um, Tokyo '64. So she was the, the perfect choice, and she was really uh, good at um, creating this um, uh, feeling uh, uh, state of trust. Uh, I think the players were quite um, surprised that the French documentarist um, was on this project because they thought that uh, it was a very Japanese um, topic. And she was, they were really um, um, familiar with um, press um, and media requests. And they, they had many interviews, but never for a, a feature documentary and with maybe uh, people that pay more attention and, and spend more time and go deeper into, into the subject. So this was um, uh, new for them. And Catherine um, phoned her, uh, phoned them and just, uh, you know, just um, create this, um, this relationship. The, Catherine asked for, the, for some news of their grandchildren, etc. They, they were like friends. And then um, step by step, introducing my, my project and the questions and and they were all uh, they all accept to welcome uh, us at their home and to um, to open their um, their memories to us so um, she was really um, successful and I'm very grateful to Catherine for this uh, Sports Illustrated and Life magazine at the time were shocked by the coach uh, Daimatsu's method of training. But of course, the player's point of view was missing. Uh, I know women who do high level sports are not afraid to train hard. What do you think this misogynistic narrative has arisen? Oh, when, I, when I read this um, American um, newspapers, I, I tried to to understood um, um, the yeah, the way the way they, they react and um, it was very interesting. Uh, I think nowadays with all these um, uh, very sad and sordid issues we have to to face every day of uh, um, harassment and sometimes um, sexual abusement or rape. It was very touchy also to um, to tell that. Uh, they were wrong and they were wrong and I was right. So that's why I asked the players to, to speak um, in their own words for themselves. But um, what is really interesting and the fact that in Western countries, uh, we were uh, convinced that Japan was uh, more misogynist and more patriarchal than our countries. And it was um, very, uh, it was a real paradox that in this country, a man um, choose to, to train women like men. And it was a paradox because in France or in Italy in the 60s, women were able to do almost everything. They were able to, to make some sports, but sparringly. They don't have to, to train too much. They don't have to get muscles or to get bruised. And when you watch French volleyball in the 60s, it's like, uh, don't go too far. Uh, it's only a game. Uh, it's, uh, it's for fun, but it's not serious. Uh, well, it's not real high level sports for sure. And I think the Westerners uh, were shocked because they were not, um, a, they were not used to watch um, women in, um, in a, in not non sparring, uh, you know, they were they train with excess without moderation, and this is, um, I think, the last thing that um, for women emancipation. I think even nowadays, for the women, um, women are able to drink alcohol like men, but men, uh, we we men, we can get drunk without any trouble, but women, when they get drunk, you know, it's we, we just think that it's not good for a woman because they don't she they don't have to uh, to show um, so much success you know not drink for for women so 
I think they, they were shocked because uh, women, they don't have to, to do it uh, excessively. And, and so I really discovered this dimension, which was, uh, I was not aware of. Um, and, and maybe, um, and for sure, the American or the Westerners um, would not have been shocked if, uh, if they were men and not women. I remember um, reading an article from an academic, uh, an American academic, so nowadays, and um, he was very uh, intelligent and he writes a, a nice article, but I think he was totally wrong. He discovered that Daimetsu um, suffered from um, female uh, women officers in, in during the Second World War because he was um, a prisoner of um, in Burma, a uh, prisoner of, of war, and um, the British uh, chose to to give uh, female officers um, the task of carry, taking care of the Japanese to uh, humiliate them more than they have it in mind. So it's, I think it's true, there is no, no, no doubt, but the academic just um, conclude that it's because he suffered from uh, humiliation from female officer that he, uh, he trained um, very harshly and, and that he was a wicked man towards uh, women, which was totally, um, I think, uh, wrong and insane because I, I asked me, uh, myself two questions. I said, okay, if Daimatsu had been um, um, humiliated by um, men officers instead of women officers, would he train um, the witches more smoothly, more gently? I don't think so. And if Daimatsu uh, had to train a, a men team instead of a women team, um, would he um, act or behave differently? I don't think so. It, wa it was more uh, a question of um, of the Japanese uh, custom and Japanese way of training, which is um, always very tough and uh, very um, no no moderation. And it, it, it really train excessively uh, like this. And your previous film about uh, John McEnroe brought to mind you know, questions about American exceptionalism and individualism. But here you are at the, the exact opposite of that with a collective portrait of a group of uh, Japanese women from working class uh, backgrounds. Uh, how did your approach to filmmaking change for this project? Oh, well, actually I, I worked really step by step. Uh, so I found the footage and tried to know more about um, and those women and I don't work with a recipe and I just try to follow the path uh, uh, open by the footage and the, the story so um, I tried to find the best way to uh, to tell this story through uh, this footage so um, the witches of the orient as you said is a collective um, story and it's also multi-layered uh, because they, they train and they lived in a very special um, era. And just after the Second World War, uh, Japan was in a very unusual situation of um, a very quick, swift um, recovery to, to rebuild the whole country, the society, everything. And um, it was very important to understood that this um, context, um, the, the witches trained in this context. I remember when I when I met the players, I was sometimes, um, you know, with the players, we, we didn't understand each other's because I have many statics, statistics and and clues that they were um, the best players of maybe all the, the all time in, in volleyball history. And they kept saying that was normal. This, they told me that they were normal people and normal women. 
And I was uh, a bit uh, upset and I said, no, you're not normal. You are uh, extraordinary players and you are witches. And they said, no, no, we are normal. And first I, I thought that it was, it was because they were Japanese. You know, Japanese people from the 60s, they, were, they don't like to showcase, to, to be in the spotlight. They are not Latin, like uh, Italians, uh, French or Americans. They don't want to show off and to say, okay, I'm the best. And so I say, okay, it was just because there are women in Japan. But that was wrong uh, because the more I knew about the story, I understood that the witches uh, train and live in a factory and work in a very special uh, time where everybody were, uh, were working very, very hard. There was a collective commitment and, and, and devotion for the nation, for the, for the to rebuild the whole country. And in the Witches of the Orient, the film, you, you see um, uh, Tokyo in um, 1945, and it's uh, a no man's land. Everything is, um, now it's, it's amazing to see how uh, Tokyo is um, um, demolished. And the last, yeah. so you, you see in the film, a few minutes after that, uh, Tokyo in 1964, so less than 20 years after that. And it's a window to the future with skyscrapers, with the um, uh, city lights, with the robots, with um, the, the fastest uh, train on earth, etc. It's amazing in less than 20 years. So everybody was so um, devoted in, in uh, the work of this whole nation was so hard that they thought they just thought that the training was normal. So I, I think the, if you uh, put the witches in other context, they won't accept. They will not accept such work, hard working. But in this context, it was like the standard and was normality, and I really discovered. It. And so the fact that they were. They, they work in a, in a textile factory, so they were also involved in this uh, uh, global uh, industrial effort and the training, etc. And also the, um, the anime dimension, uh, we, we already discussed about the fact that we know more about the anime than the real uh, players. Everything was uh, confused but confused in a good way. So I tried just to emphasize, to, to work on this confusion and to make um, a very composite film with uh, different uh, materials um, because everything was so uh, interweaved and so linked that I really choose um, this way of, um, of uh, telling this, this story because it was you can't really um, isolate and, and just um, look at the act volleyball. It was, it was into the, the popular and um, the story of um, the history of manga. It was also um, the perfect um, illustration of uh, the second, uh, the post-war uh, effort, etc., etc. So the film uh, find this. Uh, a very uh, multi-layered uh, aspect because the story was, I think, very uh, with multi-dimension and that you can't um, um, separate. Uh, and the way they train is just reflect the way they lived in, in, a, in a special time where work and um, collective, massive collective effort was uh, was needed to uh, to recover. Uh, the, the the sports uh, are the connection no, between the popular culture and society and the historical situation. If we think about Olympic Games, uh, uh, several times uh, Olympic Games are uh, was so important no, in the history. And uh, like you like you said, uh, like uh, Jean Luc Godard says, uh, uh, film lies, sport doesn't. Uh, and you uh, you quote uh, this uh, on the beginning of John McEnroe documentary. This is not the situation. Sports sometimes can can tell something uh, uh, films and movies 
can't uh, can't uh, with the with the fake stories so the true stories are are uh, more interesting more important so this is maybe an interpretation of, of your work about sports and documentary uh, about sports to talk about the sports topic as a topic uh you know i'm because i'm in charge of this um a film library and um it was a kind of opportunity, so um, it was a good opportunity to work on sports materials. But even in my relationship, my family, they they kept saying, "Okay, uh, next you you you're gonna switch to another subject." Okay, sports is okay, but uh, why don't you move uh, to a more serious uh, topic? Uh, so uh, first, I was like uh, annoyed by this, but now I'm. I'm I'm laughing at it because as sports as as um, as an occupation as a, as an event is maybe not very universal or very good but when you uh, as far as you are interested in the men and the women that um, practice and do these sports um, now you can touch uh, every theme every subject and it became it becomes something interesting. Uh, it's not sports in itself. You can just isolate it. And, but as far as you understand uh, the, the people that are involved in sports, it opens uh, all the horizons because it's humanity. It's not only sports. But I'm also interested in sports itself because I think it's not a small uh, subject. I would say that in a very general um, way, um, I'm quite uh, fascinated by uh, human um, excellence. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I like to see uh, people that are um, able to do very unusual thing. So it could, it could be musicians, it could be actors, it could be... Um, sports men or women but i think i'm very uh um i'm moved by this uh, human accomplishment the, the the fact that there are very few people on earth that uh, are um, able to have this capacity of to make um, a certain move or a certain um, performance and um, i'm just uh, amazed and stunned by this uh, human accomplishment. So it's more like this, uh, which really uh, keep me, um, you know, horny about it. I, I just want to, to know more about because it's very uh, fascinating. And um, I, when you just um, take care of the people that are involved in sports, there is no limitation. There is no, the frame is not um, for me uh, um, embarrassing. And um, I think, even it's maybe more uh, easy to work on a into a frame because you can maybe uh, use more creativity in, when you have a frame than you, when you have no no borders. It's sometimes hard uh, to find the the angles, the subject, and so sports archives is um, quite a, a, not small, but it's a real, um, it's a good frame for me to express um, many things. And I don't think uh, sports has a limitation for sure. And um, my question is about you, you, your first feature film, which was titled uh, Regard Neuf uh, sur uh, Olympia saint Cande. Uh, pardon my French, <laughs> it was, a, was a striking excavation of sorts of uh, Chris Marker, um, practically unseen and uh, unheard of uh, documentary on the 1952 uh, Helsinki Olympics Games. Uh, I would like to ask you, how did Chris Marker's work influence your style as a filmmaker uh, with, you know, the, um, the, the two movies we we're discussing about, the, the McEnroe one and The Witches of the Orient? It plays a great role uh, at the start of my um of my career of he helped me to um to believe in the fact that i was um able to make films myself 
when I was a teenager and a young grown up, I was uh, a real cinephile. Um, I watched many movies in, in Paris and we have this uh, chance in Paris to have many independent theaters. So you can watch um, cinema, well, world cinema and every period. So, but my parents were not in the field. Um, I didn't um, go to any film school. So it was really uh, not a desire. It was not in my mind at all. It was maybe because it, I thought that he was out of reach. You have to raise money and hire a crew to. to. But when I was in, uh, in the French university in Paris uh, Nanterre, uh, I discovered uh, documentaries. I was more aware, of, I was cinephile of maybe more feature films and American movies, but uh, documentaries was not in my scope. And um, I tried to, so I, I discovered this uh, cinema, which I really liked, and especially the um, documentaries that use the found footage, but not the one that we, uh, we watch on TV. The, so Chris Marker's films was amongst these um, films, and he helped me to uh, to understood that I was able to make uh, personal um, films from um, materials shot by others. So there was no there was no uh, there no need to shot myself, uh, um, and you, I can just play and build something um, from uh, previous materials. And this, this was a real uh, um, awakening. I was just discovering something that was maybe hidden inside. And it was now obvious that um, I was uh, really um, aiming um, to make films. So when I uh, tried, when I was in charge of uh, I started to, to be in charge of the film library in the, at the French Sports Institute. Uh, I was surrounded by um, film materials. So it was a real opportunity to start um, editing and playing with them. Um, so Marc really um, showed me the way to, um, to reuse it. And I really like also his um, as a, as, a, as a legacy in my work, I would say also the, um, the humor and um, it's way also to, uh, to consider the audience as, um, an, uh, as clever people. He's very respected for, uh, of the audience. He knew that um, he knew that the audience, uh, is able to understood by themselves many things that you don't have to explain everything, and I really like this way to play with the, the audience and, and also to give. Um, I, I'm sorry, maybe it's very basic, but to give pleasure. I, I, I really like to to enjoy making films and try to give uh, a, a good moment. You know, I, I don't like really to. To make the people um, uncomfortable, uh, I, I'm not the type of um, filmmaker that try to shock um, to to give you uh, a bad, to leave you a bad taste. You know, something that is not. Um, so sometimes it's good for us to uh, to be disturbed, but I'm not uh, really that type of um, filmmaker. And I think Mark really like also to give uh, some some pleasure. So some. Um, yeah, there is a real um, good experience of cinema, uh, you know, feeling good, uh, I don't know, but still intelligent, but uh, I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, basically, uh, I would say that Chris Marker legacy on my work is, very, is quite uh, important, but you also um, um, I learned from this film also to to be um, to be my to follow my own way also is very important. I don't want to um, 
to to make Chris Marker's films because I'm not Chris Marker. So uh, I try also to uh, to create my own path, and um, I have too much uh, love and respect um, for cinema to uh, to make films of others. I just try to to find new things and new angles uh, to for the audience and not to just uh, repeat um, um, uh, formats that are always, uh, already existed. So it's, so yeah, Chris Marcus, uh, like other filmmakers of this generation, try really to, um, to be innovative and to find new, uh, new way of, um, of making films. So uh, it's maybe the more, the, the biggest, uh, legacy uh, film. And I guess uh, that uh, what uh, what you are trying to do is to change the prejudice some critics and programmers have about sports films, if one were uh, to believe in that label. So here at Obo, uh, we always try to broaden our view. And I would like to ask you if you have some sports movies that you think are essential to watch. Oh, it's hard to say. Um, I think it would be the the most um, famous one um, that you already know. Uh, it depends on the context. It depends on your um, your on your needs. Uh, you know, we. I'm like everybody. Sometimes you want to have pizzas. Sometimes you have to um, have a tartufo. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, you want beer or you want a great wine. That's true. So um, it's hard to say right now. Um, my 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 wishing my best uh, list, but um, sometimes I was moved by um, more um, classical um, sports movie like um, uh, When We Are Kings. I think it's very um, classical, but it's still very uh, impressive to watch um, um, Ali in, in, in 35 millimeters and, and the soundtrack is quite amazing. So it's, a, it's more um, a TV-like documentary, but its content is quite uh, enjoyable. So uh, of course, Raging Bull was something um, unique, maybe in sports movies. And um, and many others. Uh, basketball is also very um, well represented. And uh, I remember in I remember in the in the plane, we watch um, a very um, usual uh, TV like uh, documentary on uh, Allen Iverson. But Allen Iverson was so um, a moving person. He was I was really um, fascinating by by the film. Because of, uh, of 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 himself of Iverson because this, this character is so um, human and and non and non perfect but also uh, a genius and so I, I could be a, a good uh, a good audience also I can I like uh, many different sports I also like uh, more um, intellectual movies like Walkover. Wall cover, which is uh, Jesse Skolimowski, which is a, a great film. And I think it's a really a sports film because the, the way the um, sports men and women, um, where they have to, uh, uh, to switch to a more regular life and to quit, it's a real issue. And in Wall cover, it's very uh, impressive to, uh, to follow uh, the destiny of this um, prize fighter that have to live. And he, don't, he didn't find the, his, um, his place in the world. And um, Walkover is a great sportsman too. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Julian, for your time and for this interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank having you. me. Thank and you. of course, Hobo will return next month with a brand new episode. And so we'll see in a few weeks. Goodbye. Grazie a voi. Ciao.